Welcome to Lawton Online with your host, Andrew Lawton. He's locked, loaded, and ready to fire. Lawton Online starts right now. Hello, Canada, or anywhere else in the world, wherever you're listening from. I've gotten some very, very strange, far-fetched places that have driven listeners to this program, and I'm so grateful for it. Welcome to Lawton Online here on the Rebel.media. My name's Andrew Lawton, and my goodness, it is so good to have you tuned into the show today. This is going to be a very unique program. You know, here on Lawton Online, I pride myself on trying to give you something that you might not expect or give you something that you might not hear elsewhere. And I can assure you there will likely be no greater surprise to you this week than the fact that I will be joined later on in the show by a very special guest, Premier Kathleen Wynne of Ontario. Now, if you are not an Ontario listener, I still think you should tune into this because some of the themes of the interview, some of the ideas that her government and her party is advancing in Ontario are things that go in lockstep with priorities on Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's agenda nationally for this country. And given that Premier Wynne just unveiled her cap-and-trade plan this week, this interview took place before that announcement. So keep that in mind, and I'll contextualize that a little bit more when we get up there. She's also talking about things like her provincial pension plan. Again, Trudeau has pledged an expansion of CPP in a way. So these are things of national interest. We'll be talking about that and breaking down that interview later on in the show. But before then, I want to talk about something that took place in Ottawa but has, I think, global implications, especially when we talk about that much misunderstood but often cited concept of separation of church and state. It seems to have failed in the city of Ottawa, where Mayor Jim Watson and the city itself lent its support to an effort called Ottawa Hijab Solidarity Day, taking place actually February 25th, so Thursday of this week. And in it, women are encouraged to put on a hijab to understand the plight of a Muslim woman wearing a hijab. This was not a walk around with a crucifix all day and see what it feels like to be a Catholic. This was not walk around with a red dot on your forehead to feel what it's like to be a Hindu. This was not shave your head to feel what it's like to be a Buddhist. This is a very unique event, not like anything we'd see with other religions. And I'm one of these people where I say, you know what, if you want to wear a hijab, if you want to be a Muslim, these are choices that you have in a free society. But I don't think that government has a role in promoting it. You know that any other proselytizing that took place in another religion would be met with outrage, and I think quite understandably so. But it goes a lot deeper than that for a lot of women moderate Muslims, secular Muslims, or people that have experienced persecution in Muslim countries, the hijab is a symbol of oppression, not just something as simple as religious freedom as a garment. And that was the case with Shabnam Asadullahi, an Iranian-born human rights activist who now lives in Ottawa. She also, in addition to her human rights work, occasionally writes columns and does media interviews. She actually wrote a piece about this very event for the Gatestone Institute's website, published at the beginning of the week called What is Canada Doing Celebrating Hijab Day? And when I saw this, I wanted to catch up with Shabnam. And I wanted to hear in her eyes from her experiences, this is the woman, and I'll talk to her about this later on, who was jailed in Iran after the revolution when... The Koran was the law of the land. Sharia was the law of the land. This is a woman that understands more than most Western Muslims even, and she's not a Muslim, understands the true plight of living in a not-free country. Shabnam Asad Allahi joins me on the line now. Shabnam, I so greatly appreciate the time and your work on this. Thanks very much for joining me. 
Thank you, so, thank you so very much for having me. I know that this event is taking place in Ottawa, so obviously it's not a local issue for Londoners. It's not something that necessarily is on the, the front of people's minds here. But I wanted to talk about it because I don't think this is an Ottawa issue. I think this is something that really speaks to a broader cultural problem and a societal problem here. But you've been on the ground. You're in Ottawa. Give a little bit of the background here as to why the city of Ottawa is involved with a day that is encouraging people to wear hijabs. This just sounds like a very odd role for any government, municipal or otherwise. Well, um, it has been a global event, and then it's growing in many countries and in, in, in many cities, especially in Canada. I, um, I was told that we, they had two events in uh, one of the universities in, uh, in Ottawa. They had an event in one of the universities in Calgary and also one of the universities in Toronto before having this event in Ottawa, uh, right in the city hall of Ottawa. And um, I, I, um, I heard that they had an event a few months ago in one of the universities in Nova Scotia, Canada. So um, it, is, it, is, um, um, it is a wave, growing wave, and um, I have no idea who is behind it. But um, uh, it just reminds me of the, uh, the, the start of the uh, Islamic Republic of Iran and how uh, the Iranian uh, Khomeini's regime told that, uh, you know, they will export their political Islam to the world. And this will not be stopped. And they are going to mostly export it to the West. But uh, in regards to uh, what is happening in, in Ottawa, uh, as I have uh, written um, my piece on Gatestone, it is the outrage that Hijab Solidarity Day will be taking place under the auspices of the city of Ottawa, the capital of Canada. And I do believe that it is not the role of the democratic government to celebrate religious symbols or help uh, this religious proselyzing uh, to, uh, to grow. Um, I uh, wrote an open letter to mayor of Ottawa uh, when I heard about it, and um, uh, I did not receive an answer, and it took like over a week uh, for an answer to come from uh, one of the uh, city councillor who is the deputy mayor. And um, uh, they told that, you know, they have nothing to do about it, and they don't want to get involved in the differences between the, the opinions of me, myself, and uh, the event organizer. Uh, but they simply rent the, the rooms uh, uh, to outside and to public, and they can use it if it is not violating uh, their policy. And um, when I did not hear um, a response from the mayor, um, I wrote my second letter, and then I um, emphasized on uh, the equality and uh, how outraged I was in person um, in regards of having uh, something like that in the city and why you are uh, mixing uh, 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 politics with religion, which is, uh, has no room under the umbrella of the city of Ottawa. Uh, after that, the mayor uh, responded to me, and uh, he said that again. Uh, just it was a generic email, and saying that um, we uh, we don't get involved in a difference of opinions, and we uh, we are just simply renting out the rooms. And then uh, the event uh, happened on Wednesday. They had. Um, what they call it, info session, kind of introductory session. And they had um, invited women to come. And also um, the CAWI, the organization, even um, uh, uh, supplied uh, bus tickets and rides and stuff for the, those women to come. Um, mind you that uh, we had a severe weather condition that day, and um, I was told that over 50, 55, 60 people attended the, the event. And uh, a day after this happened, the first session happened on Wednesday, February 2017, uh, uh, Mayor Jim Watson tweeted um, the, uh, the flyer on his Twitter, the whole flyer. And that really outraged me. <laughs> so if you are not getting involved in differences of opinion and you are not taking anybody's side and basically you're renting out the room, to, uh, to an organization which is uh, probably partially funded by the Status of Women of Canada, which is said in their website, partially probably, uh, well, uh, why 
do you support this event by tweeting it? I think it's a valid question, and I also wanted to get to the symbolic side of this here. Now, one of the great things about being in Canada is that we have freedom of religion. If uh, someone wants to be a Muslim, they have that right. If someone wants to wear a hijab, they have that right. But in your piece in Gatestone, you've uh, made a claim here, and I wanted to ask you about it. You said, quote, the hijab is an expression of the suppression of women and is used as a tool to persecute women by their male counterparts, unquote. A lot of Muslim women will say, no, 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 we choose to wear it, but you're saying that it's actually rooted in a suppression and oppression of women. Yes, um, yes, that's what I believe. And uh, if a woman wants to, you know, I have... I, I respect um, um, all the cultures uh, that have uh, uh, the value of democracy. I respect um, uh, every symbol of uh, religion that, you know, if anybody wants to wear a turban, wants to wear a kippah, wants to anything, a cross, a hijab, I have no problem. But uh, when you are, you are uh, bringing uh, the solidarity, walking into the shoes of your sisters, First of all, calling them sisters. Why do, I, why do you call them sisters? And then from other religion, because this is like impossible. In Islam, uh, they don't call a non-Muslim or an infidel who doesn't believe in Islam a sister. So you want those people to come and, uh, and stay in your event and try on the hijab that to me is a symbol of oppression and suppression and superiority of the, of the man over the woman. But uh, you want those people to cover and show their solidarity. Um, it, is, it is, you know, I feel that it has a, it has a political agenda behind it. Um, uh, we don't know who really started. I, I, you know, I didn't have uh, enough chance to uh, get more information about it. But one of the uh, one of the scholars, Muslim scholars, has said uh, that uh, he, in his book and in his video, that he is uh, uh, wearing a hijab uh, has a political uh, is a political symbol, and it is showing uh, that. Uh, to the to the woman or to those who don't wear the hijab that we are different than you one person and one case you mentioned in your piece that I think is so important here is Axa Parvez, Axa. the 16-year-old mm -hmm. back almost 10 years ago now, who was killed by her father in Toronto, as I understand it, near Toronto, yes. for not wearing a hijab. We also had another case where uh, there were honor killings that we all know, the uh, Shafia Shafia. case where they again were refusing to wear this. So this is something that to a lot of people, to yourself and to a lot of other uh, writers, uh, um, even uh, moderate Muslim writers or, or secular Muslim writers have said, you know, has a lot of weight behind it. Yet still, as you've pointed out here, you have the government talking about this as though this can just help people understand the plight of Muslim women by walking around wearing a headscarf. Yes, correct. But, you know, um, my question is, why do we have to have a Solidarity Day walking by those women, those women I quote, who chose to wear the hijab? who chose to wear the hijab. We are not talking about the case of Aksa Parviz and the case of the Shafia sisters who were killed for not wanting to wear the hijab in Canada under the umbrella of the multiculturalism and multi-faith and equality. The father of Aksa Parviz kills his 16-year-old Pakistani Muslim daughter for refusing not to wear the hijab. Why, do we, why don't we organize an event having all the cultures come, all the women from all the cultures come and uh, share their uh, cultural experiences and their values with those who don't know their cultural values? Why do we have to only uh, constantly bring one particular group in the society and give the power to... Uh, the extremist part of the society to take advantage of our multiculturalism and multi-faith human rights laws. Um, uh, in the event that on, on, on Wednesday some people attended, it was reported to us. I, I did not go to that uh, gathering that they had, that they had different um, tables. 
And at each different table, they labeled it different things. Like one on table was it belonged to uh, hijab and Burk, uh, hijab and niqab, and they were sitting, two women were sitting, one with hijab, one with niqab. And then there was, a, I quote, Islamophobia table. And in that table, um, uh, somebody who represented the former care's name is NC, NCCIM, NCCM. Somebody represented the organization together with a police officer uh, who was a Muslim police officer and was not uh, covering her head, and they were facilitating that uh, table. There was another table called um, uh, hijab um, and uh, mental health in hijab. So, and then in that table, I uh, I was told uh, by few people who went to the event that uh, there were two ladies sitting there facilitating, and they were talking about the, one of them was bipolar, and one of them was uh, schizophrenic. So they were talking that uh, how uh, when they walk on the streets, uh, they feel the gaze of the people and the look of the people is really affecting their mental health, um, which um, it is very interesting uh, because uh, bipolarism and uh, schizophrenic is a mental uh, mental Yes, you, you, you don't acquire those by people looking at you in a weird way. Yes. And, and, uh, and, you know, because they are wearing hijab. There was, a, there was a, at the table of niqab and the hijab, um, uh, I believe that, you know, as it was reported, the lady who was sitting one with hijab was a teacher. And she, I quote uh, from the report that told, uh, she feels safe by wearing the hijab. And she feels very, unco- very comfortable because no one dares saying that, would you like to look at my playboy? I do not understand this <laughs> when it, it was saying in the, said in the report to me. Uh, she feels safe because people don't ask this kind of questions or jokes. And then the niqabi wearing woman, um, when she was talking, uh, um, there was a woman uh, at the table at the discussion, um, just listening to them. Said, "I have a hard of, I'm hard of hearing. I'm quoting that lady, and I have to read lips. And when you are covering, I cannot understand you, and I cannot because I cannot see your lips to read them." Um, before uh, 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 the, the event had started, when people entered to the room, they, there was a table, that the signing table, and they wanted everybody to put their names and the, you know, in there to sign who they were. And the person who was at the, quote again, Islamophobia, uh, probably, um, I quote this word actually, um, table, said that uh, she told, and from the former care, I, again, NCCM, uh, uh, says uh, that she told the head of the uh, organizer, uh, the, uh, the Cowie, that if uh, they saw any uh, so-called, in their opinion, hate crime comments or very extreme comments, before they delete those comments, they must take a, a snapshot of the comments to find out, you know, who they are. So the people who attended this event to go and just find out what is happening and how they felt about it, uh, uh, they were very, very intimidated by uh, uh, by everything that happened over there because they did. They said to them that because of these women are here to talk about their experiences. And we created, I quote, a safe space for these women. Therefore, you are not allowed to ask any challenging or any questions. Here, <laughs> they are sharing their own opinion and their own values. And No, and, and, no room yes. for debate or discussion. No, not at all. And I myself, when I found out about that, and, uh, you know, a friend of mine from Montreal sent me uh, the invitation by, uh, of Cowie, which she received, she, uh, she's a, she uh, received in her mailbox, she immediately forwarded it to me. And she, I went to their Facebook page and website, and I checked. And apparently in one of their writings, uh, it, there is a link. And the link takes you to another event, which is like internationally organized uh, about hijab day, global hijab day. So uh, it makes me wonder that 
uh, who is the real organizer of this global event that they linked it even in their website. And then I went to their uh, Facebook page and I commented about my own opinion and experiences as an Iranian woman who was subject to torture and pr imprisonment at age 16 and constantly was was assaulted and was bullied by Zainab sisters, a ring of the woman, woman of uh, IRGC. Uh, is, IRGC is um, uh, a revolutionary guard uh, forces or quotes, another quotes forces of Iranian regime, which was uh, standing on the streets in Iran. And if they were uh, early revolution, and if they were saying women uh, are not covering their hijab properly and their bangs are showing, they would just immediately take them, torture them, and uh, many women were disappeared because nobody knows that what happened to those women. And, and it's also worth noting here, I mean, you were jailed for your opposition to the Iranian yes. regime as well. This is yes. not a freedom-loving country at that time. Uh, they, you know, one day I was uh, stopped by the Zainab sisters. They called them Zainab sisters, that, again, under the umbrella of I IRGC, Revolutionary Guard Corps forces, uh, that uh, I was, I was uh, 45 kilograms. Um, and I was wearing this uh, long, like a raincoat, and everybody had to wear black, dark color. We were not allowed to wear uh, bright colors, and we had to cover it, you know, from, um, you know, just to wear it like a, a long, they call it, in, in Arabic countries, they call it abaya, but in Iran, it's just like a long uh, uniform, like a, like a raincoat. So the woman, uh, I was going to pick up my brother from kindergarten, and then I was, I was just... Uh, uh, probably a few months I was freed from prison. And uh, I saw the, the Zara sister. She looked like in dark clothes. And, you know, I quote again, we used to call them, you know, after revolution, penguins are there. They were so dark, black, wearing a chador. So she told, she stopped me. And I, before, when I, when I was approaching, when I noticed her, I immediately brought my head cover down to my forehead so my, my face, my, my hair wouldn't show. She stopped me and I said, oh, my God, what is happening? No, am I going to be arrested again? And she said, what I want you to you are, thank you very much for covering your hijab very well, but I have to tell you as a woman, you must uh, walk slowly because when you walk fast, your body part shows when you move. So this is not according to Islamic religion. So make sure next time when you walk, you walk slowly. I would never forget when I was when I was in uh, before I was arrested uh, in uh, third year of high school. Um, uh, there was a uh, when when, the, when we uh, actually after the school finished, I was going to home and across the street uh, there was another uh, Zahra sister stopped a group of girls, the young girls coming from my school and they were going home. One of them uh, had her bangs down and uh, it was showing under their hijab, her hijab, the forced hijab. This was like uh, 1981. And obviously not allowed to show your hair. No, in that time. Right now, the hijab is more relaxed in Iran, but I'm yes. talking about the time that I grew up. Yeah, I, I that really at the height of the, the, I mean, the revolution. Uh, Khomeini, yes. So the Zahra sister has stopped this girl, the Zainab sister has stopped the girl. She had a tack, you know, a tack that, you know, you, you use for hanging stuff. Like to, she forced, she brought her uh, a scarf down to her forehead, and she forced the tack, the pin, inside of her forehead. Oh, wow. I never forget that scene. Uh -huh. I saw the same thing, the whole thing myself, I was, you know, the other side of the street. Everybody was in tears. And, and then she says to her, next time you don't forget to cover your, uh, your bangs. And this is the symbol that's being celebrated in Ottawa and around the world. Uh, fascinating, <laughs> fascinating story. I'm joined on the line by Shabnam Asadullahi, a contributor to Gatestone Institute and a human rights activist in Ottawa. Uh, Shabnam, really, really amazing work on this. I really do appreciate your time today. Thank you very much for your call. I've always said that protecting religious freedom is important. And you know what? I'm sure I could disagree with a lot of listeners to this program on this. And after all, I don't think disagreement is necessarily a bad thing. But I don't support any efforts to ban the burqa or the kneecap. 
I don't, because I simply think that this is a choice that people can make. And even if it's something that's imposed, I also don't think that is necessarily problematic. If someone is facing punishment, if someone is facing violence or threats for not complying, then absolutely, that's a crime. It already is. I don't support banning the burqa or the niqab, nor, for that matter, the hijab. Not that anyone's supporting a hijab ban right now. But I think that what Shabnam's comments illustrate is that we can't also forget in our Western sensitivities here and our freedom loving and freedom complacency that a lot of people have the context in which these garments are encouraged in certain other countries. And so many Muslim women will line up and say, look, I choose to wear this. And absolutely, I believe that for many of them, this is a choice. I believe for a lot of the women wearing niqabs and burqas, you're dealing with Stockholm syndrome at best and something that is not a choice at worst. That's why we've seen so many refugees, they get to this country, they immediately get out of their garb that they had to wear. It's why we've seen after people have fled Iran, much like Shabnam herself has. People who realize, oh my goodness, I'm enjoying freedom for the first time now. Freedom to dress the way I want. Freedom to act the way I want. And it's all about modesty. I get that for a lot of these people. In fact, the most ardent defenders of this say, it's about me feeling modest. But then I have to wonder why there's so much shame attached to not covering your hair in the first place for a lot of people. And this is where we get into a point that Shabna mentioned earlier, which is that we can't allow cultural relativism. And this was a theme we talked about on the show, I think it was last week or perhaps two weeks ago. We can't allow cultural relativism, this belief that all cultures are created equally, which is a load of bunk, to dominate the public discussions. But that's what's happening with this hijab day. The hijab day is really creating a situation here. It's basically the city of Ottawa version of Little Mosque on the Prairie here. Try to present it in the lightest, most fun way. And in the process of doing that, we'll just make a joke of it, even though there are a lot of people that have much more skin in the game than I do on this. People like Shabnam, people like Raheel Raza. People that have spoken out about this. Look at the women who were in that movie Honor Diaries a couple of years ago. A brilliant documentary if you haven't read it. People like that who are saying, whoa, whoa, whoa. Why is this being celebrated at all? And more importantly, why is it the government's role? And I have less of an issue with people coming together and saying, we want to have a walk a mile in her shoes type of event. We want people to wear the hijab, understand what it feels. I think that's a great experiment. I think it's a great experiment. I think that most people should walk around in a kneecap or a burqa all day and see how does it feel? How exposed to the world do you feel doing that? But should the government be encouraging it, supporting it, endorsing it? I don't think so. And if not, why not say everyone has to walk around with a cross for a day? Why not make everyone or encourage everyone to try out Ash Wednesday, even if you're not a Christian or Catholic? Why not? If we're going to make it a priority that everyone has to understand what people of other religions and backgrounds are going through, why don't we apply it to all religions? Why is this one getting this particular level of attention? I'm not sure there's an answer to that question, but I think we all know the motivations behind it. We've got to take a break here. When we come back in just a couple of moments, more Lawton Online on the rebel.media. Stay tuned, folks. I'll be right back. a reverent, intelligent, and indefatigable. You're tuned into Lawton Online with Andrew Lawton. We are back here on Lawton Online on the rebel.media. Okay, so <laughs> this story, only in Canada, I think, is the description we can apply to it here. Vince Lee the man who beheaded a passenger on a Greyhound bus in Manitoba. The victim's name was Tim McLean. The incident happened in July of 2008, almost eight years ago. He wants to leave his group home. 
He's currently living with other people that are mentally ill. He was diagnosed with schizophrenia. And Vince Lee has applied for a criminal code review, which would mean that because he was found not criminally responsible for murder, for the decapitation and attempt of cannibalizing his fellow passenger, he's been able to go through the process of moving towards independent living. He was at one point an inpatient in a secure wing of a mental health center, and then he was getting supervised walks on hospital grounds, then he was getting escorted trips into nearby communities, and then he was getting unsupervised day passes, and then last year he was moved to a group home. And this was sort of his first major coup as far as getting out of an institution and into somewhat of a normal life goes. And now his medical team is asking the review board to let him live independently, to live on his own, and to do so only on the condition that he takes his medication and that he gets monitored daily just to make sure he's taking his medication. But apart from that, he would be essentially free. The man who beheaded a passenger on a Greyhound. Sorry, I feel the need to remind people of that as we hear what's going on in this case. Now, Vince Lee appeared at this board hearing under a new name, believe it or not, Will Baker. So I guess we can call him now the artist formerly known as Vince instead of the artist formerly known as Prince. He goes by Will Baker now. Media has actually picked up on this. They've called him Baker. Baker killed Tim McLean. Baker wants to live on his own. Baker would continue to be monitored. It's like the Caitlyn Jenner thing. Once the person just decides, hey, I'm someone else, everyone just follows in lockstep with it. But the fact of the matter is, he killed a 22-year-old on a Greyhound bus and will potentially walk free if this is approved. And this is not a long shot, by the way. The Crown isn't even putting up an objection to this. The Crown has said, yep, you know what? It seems like he's been a model patient. That's what his medical team have said. So he'd be monitored for the foreseeable future, but ultimately no one's fighting, not anyone in the system, rather, the request to live independently. So this highlights a big problem with... NCR, not criminally responsible, the designation that you can apply for and be granted if it's deemed that you do not have the capacity or did not, when you committed the crime, have the capacity to be held responsible in a criminal sense. Now, there's still moral responsibility, absolutely. But in the eyes of the law, they're looking at criminal responsibility, which means if you're mentally ill and that was what led to you taking a certain action, well, Maybe you don't have to go through the justice system. You're never convicted of anything. And I I have to be perfectly candid with you here. I understand the background of that. I understand why that is a reality in the system. I get that we can't punish people who didn't knowingly do it, who didn't have that guilty mind, mens rea, they call it, in the profession. I understand that wholeheartedly, but we're forgetting that there's a reason the system is called the justice system. Because justice is ultimately what's being pursued. And we can talk about rights for killers who are mentally ill. We can talk about rights for abusers who are mentally ill. I think we're bringing up another question there, which is how many people who commit heinous acts are actually completely of sound mind. I mean, I don't think it takes a genius to say there may have been a few screws loose with Luca Magnata. Does that mean he was not criminally responsible for his actions? No, it just means he's crazy. He still has to pay for his insanity, whatever the case may be. So when we look at this, we're forgetting that one of the key points of justice is justice for victims, justice for their families, justice for the communities from which these victims were taken. If we lose sight of that, which it seems as though the status quo has, we are neglecting to actually seek and value and pursue justice in the system that clearly would need a new name. And people cannot forget about that. I've seen the anguish that Tim McLean's family, his mother, still goes through today over this incident that happened less than eight years ago. She still goes through it today. Because no parent ever expects nor anticipates nor plans to outlive their children. It's just not supposed to happen. Especially when he was 22 years old. Had nothing wrong with him. In fact, he smiled. 
to Lee. He asked how he was doing. And that was before Lee said he heard the voice of God telling him to kill the man or be killed himself. He then repeatedly stabbed him. While passengers fled the bus, he continued, mutilated the body, and was later arrested. I can't imagine for Lee, who was going through that and now is getting better, now is seeking a little bit more clarity. I cannot imagine what it must be like for him to live with that guilt of knowing I did that. I want to believe that he is not an evil person. I want to believe that, yes, this was just illness. Now he's been treated. He's getting treated. But if that's in him, if that's something that exists in him, how do we know he's going to take his medication? How do we know that there won't be an issue with the medication? How do we know he won't relapse? I've heard of lots of cases of schizophrenics who don't like taking their medication. They fall off the wagon that way. We're not dealing with someone here who might have an issue where they may harm themselves or want to harm themselves or someone who's aware and in control of it. We're dealing with someone who has already proven that they can't gain control, that they don't know the signs when things are going off the rails. And there's also a reason we don't allow guilt alone to exonerate people from consequences for their actions. There are lots of people in prison right now that I would guarantee you feel very guilty or bad about what happened. That doesn't mean that them feeling bad about it takes away from the actual punishment, takes away from what I mentioned earlier, the pursuit of justice, which we should never lose sight of at all. But we have. And this is the latest example of this. NCR is not new. There was a man going back more than a decade, I think it was 2003 or 2004, actually in my neck of the woods, London, Ontario. He took his son, who I think was like 10 years old, checked him into a hotel, killed him. He was not only found not criminally responsible, but is actually a public speaker now. Suing GlaxoSmithKline, who made the drug he was on that he attributes to him having that breakdown that led to him killing his son. When I was talking about a similar case on my radio show not long ago, I had a man called in to the show. and He said he was found NCR and said I was being insensitive. And I asked him, just out of curiosity, what was the crime that you committed? He wouldn't tell me. He said, oh, well, it's nonviolent. And I was like, well, tell me what it is. And he said, no, because in the eyes of the system, if you're found NCR, it's as though it never happened. This is the attitude to people that have received this designation. And I would venture a guess to say you could go to most victims and say, okay, the courts ruled that this never happened. How do you feel? Did your memory go away? Do you still have to live with the trauma? Well, no, you shouldn't have to. You shouldn't have to live with it. After all, it's like it never happened, right? But this was the attitude. This is the problem with it. And again, I don't deny that there are people who feel guilty and feel bad about it. I don't know Vince Lee or Will Baker. I can't tell you what's on its heart. I can't tell you what's on his mind. I can't tell you if NCR was a ploy by a lawyer or not. But I can certainly tell you that lawyers try to use that in their toolkit of defense options. But that's another story. I can't tell you that. All I can tell you is that a community still grieves the loss of his victim. That a family still grieves the loss of a victim. And even though Aristotle once remarked that the law is reason free from passion or free of passion, even though that quote was made, there's a reason that we have victim impact statements. I looked this week at a very high-profile court case, the sentencing hearing of Marco Muzo, the very well-to-do 29-year-old who killed three children and their grandfather in Vaughn while drunk driving. He blew three times over the legal limit. Now, in a lot of ways, there are lots of people that drive drunk and they only injure themselves. Lots of people that drive drunk and they hit a lightning or a light post. He drove drunk, hit a car full of people, killed them all. We heard heartbreaking testimony from those children's parents, from the mother specifically. You murdered my babies. It was actually Karen Lieberman, former Sun News Network personality, that was covering this case. A lot of people were, but she was tweeting it. And I was following just with my jaw agape at what she was writing. She was basically giving the exact quotes that the mother, Anita Neville Lake, was giving, 
so dramatic because she's living with that pain and will for the rest of her life. And I look at a guy like Marco Muto. Again, this is a hypothetical interpretation of what's happening, but he was drunk driving. What if he was an alcoholic? I don't know if he was, but what if he was an alcoholic? You see, alcoholism is a diagnostic designation. Alcoholism is a mental illness. Addiction is, by definition, a mental illness. Whether you accept it as that or not, it is. So what happens if he said, well, you know what? I was only drinking because I was an alcoholic. Therefore, I'm not criminally responsible. And what if you found a judge who said, you know what, you've made your case? Would there be justice? Could you imagine saying to that woman who will never get to hold her three children again, could you say to her, well, you know what, I'm sorry about your family, but this man is ill. He needs our help. Sure, help someone, treat them, do all that. But do not turn your back on the victims and their families. And I can't stress enough how the system has basically been flipped on its head from what I think most people would acknowledge is or at least should be its priority now. So much so that people now feel as though the system ignores common sense entirely. And you know what? Some decisions make it very difficult to cast that down, make it very difficult to deny that, to reject that premise. And I look at the countless cases where, even in the best of circumstances, it appears that justice is not served. And then I look at a case like this one, where a family grieves and the courts do nothing about it. They treat the man, they say, take your medication, and they're probably going to say, and have at it, enjoy your new life, enjoy your new name. Well, Tim McLean still lies. How's that justice? Taking a quick break here. When we come back in just a couple of moments, more lot online here on the rebel.media. Stay with me, Canada. I'll be right back. You're listening to Lawton online with your host, Andrew Lawton exclusively on the rebel.media email your thoughts to andrew at andrewlawton.ca or tweet andrew using at andrew lawton welcome back this is lawton online here on the rebel.media so this segment i'm sorry i still get giggles thinking about it Last week, I had the chance when Ontario Premier Kathleen Wynne was coming through my hometown, London, Ontario, to interview the Premier. Now, I've tried to interview her in the past. I've never spoken to her nor met her. I've interviewed a couple of liberal cabinet ministers before. But I am, generally speaking, very critical of a lot of decisions, ideologically and practically speaking, that this government makes. So I've understood that maybe they haven't been available for an interview. Well... Much to my surprise and much to my pleasure, it happened. I was a little bit apprehensive. I'm like, okay, should I have a backup plan just in case the interview never happens? But it did. And I spoke to the premier and all I said in the outset, what I was trying to book the interview is I'd like to talk about the economy and I'd like to talk about the Ontario retirement pension plan. Now, at the time, I knew that cap and trade was going to be an announcement that was coming. I didn't know that it was going to be coming this soon. So just for context here, the interview was recorded on February 19th. So it was recorded last Friday. So after the last episode of this podcast came out. But a lot of the themes are still very current. And this is from my radio station, AM 980, where I did the interview. The reason I'm playing it for you, I'm going to give you all the sections of it here, is because I think this is such a concerning trend. We have a sweep in this country right now, almost unanimously left-leaning premiers with a very left-leaning prime minister. And if it weren't for Saskatchewan and poor Brad Wall down there holding the fort, the left would be able to pretty much do as much as it wanted in Canada where it counts. We've seen a liberal majority in Ontario, an NDP majority in Alberta, a federal liberal majority as well. And in Quebec, well, no offense to you guys, but it's Quebec. You guys have messed things up for a while there. And a lot of the priorities that Wynne wants to put forward 
at a provincial level or things that Trudeau wants to put together at a federal level. Every time I see a picture of the two of them, I just get this shiver because I know that birds of a feather are indeed flocking together in this case. So this is my interview with Premier Kathleen Wynne. Premier, great to talk to you and great to have you back in London again. Thanks for your time. Thanks, Andrew. Appreciate it. So let's talk a little bit about the economy here. We saw the numbers this morning from Statistics Canada, inflation up uh, 2% over this time last year nationally and also in Ontario. So a lot of Ontarians, let's face it, seeing rises in the cost of living. Let's talk about the impact that that is having on individual people, because let's face it, it's budget time coming up. People are feeling a crunch. What's the government's response to numbers like this? Well, let me just say, first of all, that uh, we know, Andrew, that uh, the national economy is uh, is struggling. You know, there's a <clears throat> there's a real challenge nationally and uh, and globally. Um, Ontario is uh, is going to be one of the leaders, and and you know our focus is on creating jobs and uh, economic growth. Our uh, third quarter results for 2015 show that our uh, real GDP has grown 0.9 percent. We've outpaced both the Canadian and the U.S. economies. We've got more foreign direct investment uh, than any other jurisdiction in North America for the last two years. And what that means is that we're creating jobs in this province. Since the recession, uh, we've created more than 600,000 jobs. And in fact, um, the last two months, we've been one of the only uh, provinces in the country that has created jobs. So, so we're, you know, in a, in a relative sense, we are, uh, we're doing well. As I say, we're going to be one of the leaders this year in the country. But that doesn't take away from the reality that, uh, that people you know, people are struggling and uh, it's our responsibility to do everything in our power to make sure that we uh, we continue that upward trajectory. In the inflation numbers, one of the biggest costs that people had to shoulder uh, as far as inflation goes was actually rising fuel costs. Now, I know your government has said it will unveil the details of its cap and trade plans in the near future within the coming weeks. One thing we have seen in Quebec from its adoption of cap and trade, though, was a rise in fuel costs of two to three point five cents per liter. Is that really something that you can comfortably put on Ontarians when that's already an area where the costs are rising for people? So let's let's just. Um, come at this from uh, another angle, Andrew, because the reality is that the cost of not doing anything in terms of climate change is enormous. So if we look at the flooding that has happened uh, in Ontario, we don't have to go outside of Ontario to, to find that. You uh, think about the uh, the drought in some parts of the country, the fires that have uh, that have happened, the extreme weather events. There are costs associated with all of those things. And so what we know we need to do is we need to tackle we need to tackle climate change. We need to take on our responsibility as a as a province in the national context and in, in the international context. And that text and that is that is about saving insurance dollars. It's about saving um, uh, repair dollars. It's about saving our communities, quite frankly. So if we're looking at a fuel increase of 3.5 cents per liter, and these are numbers that came from an announcement that your government made uh, last April looking at Quebec, and not to mention the cost that that adds to products that have to be transported, et cetera, are you saying that that rise is worth it with the benefits? Well, let me say the, the other piece of this is that as we bring in our cap and trade system, what people will see is how we are going to reinvest dollars that come through, uh, through that cap and trade uh, system into their homes, help them to retrofit their homes, help them to deal with some of the costs that may, associ- may be associated with not being able to conserve energy, not having efficient uh, buildings and so on. So you're going to see that we will be making those kinds of investments that will, that will offset um, the, any costs that may come as a result of the, of the cap and trade system. And that's, you know, that's an important aspect of this. It's, and it applies not just to individuals, but it also applies to businesses because businesses have raised the same issue. You know, what are the additional costs that we are going to have to bear? And our, you know, part of the response is that, um, we need to make reinvestments as that revenue, uh, comes in. We need to re, um, reinvest it in order to make businesses more efficient to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And that's how, that's how as a society, we become more efficient and we uh, were able to deal with the costs. 
when we look at those rising costs for businesses, obviously there were some documents released this week that your government did some polling on the Ontario Retirement Pension Plan. And uh, in that, uh, and in those results, rather, businesses are saying that uh, 54% of them rather anticipate a hiring freeze when the ORPP is implemented. Uh, Two thirds have said they'll need to do other operating cuts. Several as well said they anticipate layoffs. So are you saying that in pushing this forward, then, that those are acceptable losses for businesses in Ontario? Well, those are um, those are theories. And in fact, when we've seen enhancements and uh, changes in CPP, for example, Andrew, in the past, um, those projections of job loss and so on did not uh, did not come to fruition. Well, and, they're not theories, though, if you're talking to the people that are actually going to be making those decisions when the plan is implemented. Well, all I'm saying is that the same kinds of things were said in the 90s when there were changes made to CPP and the job losses didn't happen. So, So the reality is that we've got the majority of the population in Ontario not able to save enough for their retirement. They don't have workplace pension plans. And so we are, you know, we're convinced that um, that's, an un- that's an untenable situation because if we, if we let that persist, then what that means is that businesses down the line, government down the line, and, and that means individual taxpayers, are going to have to pay more to deal with people who don't have security in their retirement. And, you know, this isn't just an Ontario issue. This is a problem across the country. And so we are, we're moving ahead. We're going to continue to work with the federal government and uh, with our colleagues across the country to see if we can land on an enhancement of the CPP. But if that's not possible, um, you know, we will be there with the Ontario Retirement Pension Plan, which ultimately will create economic growth. It will create prosperity because people will be able to uh, they'll be able to spend in their retirement. They'll be able to have. Uh, they'll be able to have that security. But you're also advancing a program that limits people's ability to save for themselves. I've talked to a few people that are in that gap of being in their 50s or early 60s. They're having to pay into this, even though the results are not really going to be all that positive or all that uh, dramatic for them. Well, but but what we know, I mean, what the you know, we're not we're not doing this, Andrew, based on. Um, a political ideology. I mean, we we look at the evidence, and what we see is that people are not able to save enough. So when you say that we are restricting people from saving, in fact, people aren't able to save. The vast majority of uh, people working in Ontario are not choosing to, or not able to, um, put aside uh, enough money for their retirement. And so when I, you know, when I look at uh, young people in their 20s and 30s and 40s, they're looking at retirement insecurity. And that's, uh, that's as I say, that's not, it's not good for them as individuals, and it's not good for businesses in the province, and it's not good for our society. How is it not rooted in the ideology that government is better able to figure out what's best for people than they are, though? Because that's what you're saying here, that people can't be trusted to save for themselves, so the government has to do it for them. Well, I think I mean, if you follow that argument to its logical conclusion, then we wouldn't have a Canada pension plan. And I think if but you, we do, though, it's already in effect. Yeah, but it's but it's inadequate, Andrew. The thing is, there's no there's no automatic improvement mechanism in the Canada pension plan. And so right now, the average payout of the CPP is around six to five hundred dollars, and the maximum payout is in the order of twelve thousand dollars. That's not enough for people to uh, to uh, retire on, and so we're you know what we're saying is it's time for it's time for an improvement. It we would we would have loved to see uh, an enhancement to the Canada Pension Plan that didn't happen. It doesn't look like it's in the offing at this point. And so we said, in the absence of that, we're going to carry on and do what we know is necessary for people to have uh, some security in their uh, in their retirement. In the same way that when when CPP was created, it wasn't created out of an ideology. It was created because uh, people were struggling to uh, to imagine what their what their retirement was going to look like and. Thousands, millions of people in uh, in this country have benefited from the Canada Pension Plan. You've told Ontarians that the design is complete, but one detail that we haven't really seen yet is the cost of it. Do we know what we're looking at as far as the cost just to administer this program and to operate it? 
Um, we don't have we don't have those final numbers at this point, but uh, it will it will be the the cost to administer the CPP. First of all, will be less because now we have a federal government that is actually going to work with us, and the Canada Revenue Agency is going to uh, be cooperating with us, and that's a that's a, a very good thing. That will take costs out of the uh, the delivery of the OP, ORPP. Um, but we also know that we'll be able to deliver this because of the scale of it. Um, in in line with uh, the costs of other uh, of other large pension plans, uh, economists from UBC, Carleton, and the University of Calgary, though, have said that because you're dealing with a program smaller than CVP, it's not going to be possible to have that cost lower than CVP, like you just said. Well, I didn't say it would be lower. I said it would be in line with the cost of the other large pension plans. So, um, you know, when we when we finally got those costs in place, it will uh, we'll be able to talk about that. But um, and I, I agree, it's not as large as the CPP, but it is in line with some of the ar- other large pension plans, and the costs the costs will be uh, will be comparable to those. Joining but I think the you know at the end of the day, Andrew. Um, what we know and uh, what we have heard from people all over the province is that they're worried, some of them not so much for their own retirement, you know, people who are at the end of their working life. This isn't, this isn't going to benefit, as you say, it's not going to benefit, benefit 60, 62-year-olds who are about to go into retirement. If they have a few years where they pay in, they will be able to get that money, uh, they'll be able to get that money back. But it's not going to be, it's not going to be what will sustain them in their retirement. But it really is about about the uh, young people who are starting their careers who are not necessarily going to have a workplace pension plan. I mean, my vision is that uh, once the ORPP is implemented, everyone in Ontario will either have a workplace pension plan that is uh, adequate to their retirement security or they will be enrolled in the ORPP. And that will mean that there will be much better coverage for people when they retire. That's the, that's the vision. That's not an ideology. That is about having practical solutions to a, a real problem. I know we're just about out of time, Premier, but I wanted to ask, uh, finally, you mentioned that it won't impact positively or make a huge difference for people in their 60s. Why not put an age cutoff then for people to only contribute into this if they're going to be in that group that is going to reap the full benefits of it? Well, you know, again, um, we're we're implementing this in a way that is going to uh, it's going to be phased in. People will, um, as I say, if they uh, if they pay in for a very short period of time, they they'll be able to get the benefit of uh, of that money uh, back. Uh, they'll be able to get that money back. But but really, this is about bringing in a very important. Uh, improvement to our retirement security plan that is, as I say, addressing a challenge that is uh, affecting individuals, but it's affecting us as a society. Premier Kathleen Nguyen joining me on the line. Great to have you in London. Thank you again very much for your time, ma'am. Thank you very much, Andrew. Take care. We know from information that has come out this week that the actual amount that Ontarians are going to be out with cap and trade at the fuel pumps is actually more than in Quebec. And more than analysts have said would probably creep into Ontario. We're looking at 4.3 cents on the litre. Not to mention five bucks a month on everyone's natural gas bill. And what I find most incredible is that to curb rising electricity rates, this just baffles me. The provincial government has said Ontarians won't get more hydro rate increases. Not that we could afford anymore, given that we are the most expensive jurisdiction for hydro in North America. Except for maybe Hawaii, but you know, they're on the beach. Who cares? They don't have to pay to heat their homes. Not only will the government say, well, they won't actually rise, they might actually lower, because the government says they'll be able to do this by revenue gained by selling carbon credits, which will be used to offset rising hydro rates. Now, even if that happens, even if that happens, Ontarians are still paying for their hydro rates. Ontarians are still paying extra. We're just paying when it's tacked on to the price tag of any good or service we want by a business that needs to, well, pay to keep its own lights on during peak hours, I might add. So we have this. We have pension plan enhancements, both things that the federal government would love to try on its own. And I think the big question here is what the heck are Ontarians going to do? And when this all becomes nationalized, what the heck are Canadians going to do? To be able to have any sort of subsistence that doesn't rely on the government. 
You know, when Premier Wynne says this is not about ideology, I have to challenge her, and I did challenge her, as you heard, and said, actually, it is. You're basically saying here, and she didn't answer it directly, that government is better suited to spend people's money and to save people's money than people are. That saving the planet, that fighting global warming, which hasn't happened in nearly two decades, is more important than people being able to not have to put their gas tank fill-ups on their credit card. Along with, you know, their hydro bill. Along with, you know, any other expenditure. Especially if you're a small or medium-sized business owner, like 90% of the Canadian workforce is employed by. I was talking about this on my show after the interview, obviously, and someone said, you know what, this government is so dumb. And I took issue with that. The government's not dumb. The government's not inept. The government is not incompetent. Kathleen Wynne is none of those things. In fact, I'm pretty sure that it would be better if they were. No, the government is quite capable. She knows precisely what she's doing. And you know what? She's doing it well. She's enacting her agenda exactly the way she should be right now. And it's the reason she has virtually unfettered access to expanding the role of government, because she has done her job well. So do not underestimate her. Do not underestimate her government. And similar to Trudeau, do not estimate him. He may not be the most brilliant political mastermind in the world. But we know that Gerald Butts, his chief advisor, knows what he is doing. And they have, similar to in Ontario, similar to in Alberta, the power to do what they want. We saw that this week with the BDS vote. I'll talk about that a little bit more next week, I think. They know what they're doing. We are the ones that have to pay for it. Do not underestimate. Folks, I've got to wrap things up for the program today. Cling to your wallet while you can. And don't get me wrong, I will be too. Lawton Online resumes next week. You're listening to The Rebel.media. I'm Andrew Lawton. Thank you, God bless, and have a good week, Canada. Thanks for tuning in to Lawton Online. Check out The Rebel.media for lots more fearless content and commentary.